Okay, so there are subdivisions of the anatomy, and we will be discussing the, these divisions one by one. Uh, actually, it's like dividing the anatomy into a cadaveric anatomy, then we have the living anatomy, we have the macroscopic and microscopic anatomy as well. So the cadaveric anatomy is actually the anatomy in which we study in cadavers, like the dead bodies. It's like about dissecting their organs and studying each and every detail, the bones, the muscle attachment, their origins, their insertions, and the basic um, the basic relationships of uh, the important structures. So mainly the cadaveric anatomy is like dealing or trying to study, study the anatomy on cadavers or the dead bodies. Then you have the living anatomy. Now, how do you study the living anatomy? It's like you have a patient and then you have to apply your clinical and your basic knowledge of the anatomy on a patient who is living and then you have to do particular uh, inspection, palpation, auscultation um, and percussion as well to study about the living anatomy. Now you could be studying uh, the living anatomy by inspecting a patient or using some kind of specific instrument to study about the living anatomy. Then you have the developmental anatomy. To study the developmental anatomy is very, very much important. Why? Because if you know embryology is 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 a kind of a sub uh, subject of the anatomy, okay, subdivision of the anatomy, and you start to uh, learn how. Let Let's suppose we are talking about the development of the heart, or we are talking about the development of the genitourinary system. So how cells and their, their, which is their basic origin, and what are the endoderms, which are the mesoderm, or the organ is mesodermal in origin, it's endodermal in origin, you all have to study that in the developmental anatomy. Why developmental anatomy is important? Because if there are, if you know the normal developmental anatomy, then you can actually find out what the pathology is going on. Because there, there can be some teratogens or there can be mutations that would be affecting a normal developmental process. Like, like if a normal human being would have an upper lip and a lower lip and a proper heart and a soft palate. But those uh, babies who uh, are born with a cleft lip, obviously they have some developmental abnormalities, right? And those like um, the, the the babies who are uh, with the trisomy, with the Down syndrome, like the Turner syndrome, they have uh, the mutations at the genetic levels or they have some kind of developmental abnormalities, right? So that's why it is important to know the normal developmental process which in, which is taking place in a human body. If there is a deviation or some kind of developmental abnormalities, then obviously the organ uh, would be malfunctioned or the baby would be malfunctioned. So that's important to know how you are uh, dealing with the developmental anatomy. Now you have the macroscopic anatomy and a microscopic anatomy. So the macroscopic anatomy is like that is visible to your eyes, right? Your naked eyes, right? You can see the hands, you can see the eyes, you can see the sclera, you can see conjunctiva, you can see the bridge of the nose, the lips, the teeth, the cleft palate, the overall uh, externally, you can see the skin, your hands, and then your arms, your shoulders. So this is a macroscopic anatomy, which is quite visible to you. And if you open up the body, for example, the chest is being opened, you can see the lungs with your naked eye, you can see the abdomen with your naked eyes, the organs, the liver, spleen. So these are, this is the macroscopic anatomy. Now the microscopic anatomy is is very important, like the histopathological study, in which you have to see the normal cytology. If, if the cells are, uh, you know, of the normal size and shape, there's, there's no, they're not hypertrophic, or they're not atrophic, or they're not, there is no hyperplasia, they are exactly behaving normally, then study of the epitheliums, like the respiratory system has ciliated columnar epithelium, right? So if there would be metaplasia, uh, that means that epithelium would be replaced by some other epithelium, so that would be a pathological process, right? So in order to find out the pathological process, it's important you know the microscopic anatomy. Like you should know what, how the cells of a specific organs would behave, what would be their cytology, what would be their epithelium, and if there is uh, any metaplastic changes or if there is any cancer changes in the cell, you can pick it up by histopathology. That is also the subdivision of the anatomy. Now you have the surface anatomy. 
Okay, before studying every single organ, you study the surface anatomy. That means if you are externally, like I'm talking about my hands, okay? So this is the surface, okay? And I believe that I have a skin, then I have a superficial fascia, then I have some kind of a, a muscles, and then you have the bony structure. Like the, we have the metacarpal bones, we have the proximal distal interphalangeal joints, right? So how, how would a surface anatomy, like what about the surface anatomy? So that means that this is exactly like when you say, when you're talking about a hand, so we say there is a proper uh, part which is called as an anatomical snuff box, okay? So this is the surface anatomy, it's, it's in between the two tendons, so obviously this would be the surface anatomy. So similarly, if you're studying about the lungs, and we know that they are extending from the clavicle, apex is just above, above the clavicle, and then they're down, extending to the coastal margin. So that is a surface anatomy. So how would you mark that particular organ on a skin that would be surface anatomy? Like, let's suppose I'm studying about liver. So I should know what is a surface anatomy of a liver, right? So it's actually second, uh, second rib to eighth rib. This is the normal uh, span of the liver. So this is when I'm marking this second to eighth rib, that is the surface anatomy of a liver. Same goes for the spleen. Uh, so the, mainly it's uh, between the ninth and the tenth rib. So I know the surface anatomy of the spleen. So that's how surface anatomy is going to uh, help you locating different organs. Then you have radiographic and imaging anatomy. So radiology, to study the radiology, you should have a very grasp uh, concept uh, of the anatomy and uh, radiology and imaging anatomy is all about because you're doing the x-rays, you're doing the CT scan, you're doing the, uh, you know, MR, MRCPs and you're doing the MRI as well. So when you are dealing uh, with the radiological and imaging anatomy, that's a subdivision of the anatomy. So that's called as radiological anatomy. Now applied anatomy. Now, what do you mean by applied anatomy? Applied anatomy means that you know that, uh, okay, you're, you're doing some kind of laparotomy or let's suppose you're doing some kind of surgery within the abdomen. And you know that uh, the anatomy, which is clinically applicable, is like you should know the location of the intestines. You should know where the transverse colon is. You should know uh, the, the different parts of the duodenum. You should know their regional anatomy. The first part of the duodenum is related to what? The second part of the duodenum is related to what? So important, uh, the relationship with the portal vein or superior mesenteric arteries and veins, that is actually the clinical applied anatomy, right? Then uh, let's suppose I'm doing a, some kind of surgery on a thyroid. So my knowledge of anatomy would help me in the surgery. How? Because I know that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is in the groove between the trachea and esophagus, right? And obviously it's somehow related to the recurrent laryngeal nerve is somehow related to the artery, uh, inferior thyroid artery, right? So what I am supposed to do, I'm, I'm, I need to uh, secure the recurrent laryngeal nerve. How can I secure the recurrent laryngeal nerve when I don't know it's exactly where, where the recurrent laryngeal nerve would be? Where can I find the re, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve? So that is the applied anatomy. The knowledge of the applied anatomy is very much important. Then you have the experimental anatomy. It's like kind of a side effect anatomy in which you're going through the different kinds of testings and just uh, testing for the organs or um, epitheliums and it's kind of experimental anatomy. Then you have genetics, again, a very important part, more related to the developmental anatomy, the mutations. Uh, if you uh, know the normal genetics, uh, the chromosomal pattern, then obviously you would be uh, knowing the normal developmental process. Then you have the comparative anatomy in which you study the comparison between the different organs. It's not just the uh, human being, but you try to study the comparative anatomy in different organs of the different species. That is called as a comparative anatomy. Then you have the physical anthropology. That's also kind of a, um, you know, anatomy, but it's it's not related to the humans. It's related to other or other, other uh, species like the insects most of the time. So anatomy is a very vast subject, but when you are uh, trying to study anatomy specifically for organ or a region, you should know the basic developmental anatomy. Then you should know the histopathology of that organ. 
or that system or that region. And then you should know the blood supply, the basic structural organization, the lymphatic drainage. So when we'll, we will be uh, uh, discussing about the regional and organ specific anatomy, we'll be discussing all these parameters. For now, you should know what does a cadaveric anatomy is, how, how are you going to study about the living anatomy, then developmental anatomy, and their roles of the subdivisions in your clinical life or your uh, experimental life. Okay, so the cadaveric anatomy told you uh, it's again the study or dissection uh, on uh, on a dead a dead being, right? So we have uh, the organization like we can study about the regions, like we we, we can divide as as uh, like we are comfortable studying, okay? So we can divide in regional, systemic, in a cross-sectional study. Regional is like I'm studying the upper limb, so I'm more focused on upper limb. Then you have thorax, then you have the abdomen, then you have the lower limb. So this is the regional distribution. Now, what do you mean by systemic anatomy? Systemic anatomy is like I'm studying about the cardiovascular system, then I'm studying about the respiratory system, then I'm studying about the GI system. So this is about the uh, systemic organization. Then you have the cross-sectional anatomy. And let's suppose this is the cross-section of the abdomen, right? And you can see there are thoracic vertebrae, then you have the diaphragm, and this is the chest, and you can see the uh, dome of the diaphragm, and then you have the pleural cavity. So again, you can see the falciform ligament of the liver. So cross-section is like the transverse plane, uh, the structures where you divide the body like this in a transverse plane. So the study about the cross-section. So whenever you're studying anatomy, you have to do the regional anatomy, you have to do the systemic anatomy, and you have to go through the cross-sectional anatomy as well. Okay, now we have the living anatomy in which we will study about the inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, and you can also go for a direct visualization. So by inspecting, you're not touching the patient. Let's suppose you're inspecting the oral cavity. You will ask your patient to open his mouth, and then you're going to uh, you're gonna inspect. You're going to look for any abnormality. You're going to look for any bleed. You're going to look for any abscess, any, ca any you know, uh, discharge. Same goes for abdomen as well. So every system uh, should be examined, keeping in view these four important steps. So inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And that's how you can inspect a particular system, like you're inspecting the thyroid. So you are, um, it's an endocrine uh, um, system, okay? So you're examining the endocrine part. So you're gonna look for, uh, you're gonna look if there is uh, swelling over the thyroid. You're gonna look for tongue protrusion. You're gonna ask for swallowing. And then you're gonna inspect, you're gonna touch. You, you will obviously look for for lymphadenopathy, that's about the palpation. Now, percussion is mostly for the abdomen and chest, and you see if there's a dull percussion or resonant percussion, and then you're gonna go for auscultation, and then you have a direct visualization. Let's suppose you're examining the ear, then you would be needing a proper instrument that is otoscope for a direct visualization. So the cadaveric anatomy is to study on a, uh, on a dead being, do the dissection, and to study about the living anatomy is like, you know, living being, and you have to examine that particular system, and you're going to look for signs, symptoms of that particular disease to make a proper diagnosis. So these are the subdivisions of the anatomy, and you should have a very uh, accurate knowledge of anatomy uh, so that if you're performing any surgery, uh, you should know each and everything about the anatomy. You should know the developmental anatomy. You should know what changes can you expect in a body. So this is all about the anatomy.